Hi everybody. So um, it's uh, I'm going to talk about how we, uh, for the past year, uh, created uh, several libraries of shared components for a client I've been working. I'm working on. I'm working with. Um, first, let me introduce myself. So hi, I'm uh, Xavier Lefebvre. I'm uh, I'm French. I live in Paris. I'm a team leader on React and React Native projects for a company called BAM. Indeed, um, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a uh, it's Overall, it's a consulting and development agency. We work for, uh, for any type of, uh, of companies to accompany them to build some successful products. Um, and so as any of you in this room, I do love tech as much as I love traveling. So being there with you today is quite, is quite nice. It's like a, quite an amazing opportunity to go to India. And um, like that, good. You're less gonna hear the breathing. Now it's good. That. You hear me well? Yeah. Okay. No. No. Okay. Thank you. And I, I do also love, among other things, motorcycles. But why do I put motorcycles here? Because I have this little image of a of a motorcycle and all its components, and it made me think of that. Uh, what we're doing is a little bit of that because it's like many different components with different sizes, with different responsibilities and scope that we need to assemble together to make a website or to make several websites. And depending on the motorcycle, some components can be reused on other websites. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about why we, we started this project of shared components and what, how we try to tackle this, uh, this topic. Then I'm going to deep dive in some of our design decisions that helped us make this a success. And at the end, I'm going to tell you, it's a little bit of a business part, I'm going to tell you how we, um, we consider that we're making it a success and uh, how we organize ourselves, up, how we organize ourselves to, um, to, to tackle the issues that, uh, that other teams or our team meet uh, while developing on this project. So it started from a wish last year. Um, our client, which is a big bank, said it would be awesome if we could finally and successfully, because we already tried, create shareable components in order to read them on different apps, give them to other departments, or even one day, potentially, sell them outside. We didn't reach this place yet. We're still at, we're, we're approaching give them to other departments. So why did they say that? Uh, we, it's been a long time we work with this client and we developed a lot of different websites um, over the, like, almost the, pa the past seven years. And it happened quite some time that uh, we, re we redeveloped the same kind of features, slightly different, but in the end, the business of the bank is always the same behind, and so some features can be accessed, could be reused and are reused effectively on websites which have a different uh, user user um, target. So let's see a little bit what I mean by that. So that's an example. Okay, that's an example of one of those features. It's 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 a full page feature. It's called a fun sheet. A fun being like a um, a source of money uh, that that's used to 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 be invested, and it's part of life insurances, for instance. And this specific um, feature, it's, it's a full detail of the fund. So it can, be, it can be interesting, and it is interesting for, for B2B, for internal, uh, internal purposes, or B2C. And this fund sheet has been, for instance, remade several times for different websites. So our first attempt, which was named Commando, so the setup is, a team is working on one website, another team is working on another, but they have to share a component. There is something there that they could reuse. So what we did is we created, out of the blue like that, a common code base, which was called Commando, and both teams were contribu contributing. From that, we output a simple, huge JS bundle that was served directly as a script, so we, which was directly downloaded by the website. Problem was with that, that the code base was, was growing without a specific architecture. And so, so a, lot, a lot of components were really didn't, find, didn't follow the same syntax or the same architecture. The JS bundle was huge, same, just one for every, for every purpose. And in the end, uh, at this time, there, there was no versioning uh, strategy. So if you, had, if you pushed a new version with breaking changes, you could be pretty sure it's gonna, it would break your website. So after that, well, of course, we, we, it didn't work out, we ditched it. After that, a second, a second project was called Tapas, which is, I don't know if you know about Tapas, 
which is uh, like a, a little uh, Chinese dish, food, that's, that's meant to be shared. And um, so same setup at the, at the beginning, but this time one team started to own the project. So they were the, the one taking care of its architecture and its, its improvement. Or the other team, for instance, team two or, or more, were contributing to the, to the project directly. Then this time we versioned, of course, RJS bundle. Um, on GitHub directly, and we package we package them so they could they could bring bring it directly into their code base before bundling the final website. It still had some issues. First issue is once again the first team team one the, the team one, but first and main objective was to take care of its own website. So they didn't really think enough in terms of of uh, reusability, and they didn't really have this this uh, this focus. Second one being that. Once again, it was a big JS bundle. So any type of com any components, even if you didn't use, need them, you, you had to, to bring them into your final bundle. And last one is that it was on G the versioning system was on GitHub. So you needed a GitHub account to be access to our private GitHub, GitHub team to be able to access them. So it was clearly not, not perfect. And there is solutions for all of that, but we didn't at this time um, at try to, to use them uh, properly. So last attempt last year, at the moment where the, our client set the quote I, I told you, uh, we, la we launched the, this project, which, which is called Component Studio. Same setup at the beginning. So this time, with a specific core team, like you would have for any, uh, for any open source uh, project. And other team contributing. After that, we created and split our architecture in several libraries. And, uh, and same, at the end, we packaged it in order to be reused on the, on the host projects on the, on the websites. But this time, for each of the solutions, we, for, 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 you, for managing several libraries into one repository, we use Lerna, which you might, which you might know, which is a monorepository mono -repository manager. And uh, for, the, for uh, giving the, our packages to, to, our, to our users, we used Verdacho, which is a, a private NPM, open source. And this made a big, big difference. Thanks to, to this, we can say, and I'm going to give you a, a proof at the end, that it works. So that's, that's, that's a demonstration of what we have not right now in our project of reusable components. It's, we use Storybook. It's our basis of development, of validation, and it's our showcase as well. Everything is accessible from there. So a developer, when, when he's going to develop, he's going to develop thinking, even though it's, he is from another team and he needs to contribute, he's going to th develop thinking about reusability because he's going to develop directly inside of, of Storybook, apart from his own project. Storybook is extremely uh, convenient in order to, 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 to play around with your components. You, you have the knobs, so it's the props of your component. You can play around with them and see the impact it has in live. And, um, and it's also used for our own product owners to validate and to, um, to show what the capability and what the components are available in, um, in our project. So let's, let's dive in for some tips uh, of what we think made the difference. So we, if, we can, if we come back to this, this part of the, of, the, of the diagram, first I want to I wanna dive in a little bit into how we organize our packages and components. Then let's dive in a, li a little bit more into our code structure of each of those components. And finally, how we limit the impact of breaking changes, because it's a project, for instance, there is six other teams working with us on a daily basis and pulling, pull, uh, pulling requests um, of changes on the, um, on the code base. So we are not capable as a core team to, to check all of them. The thing is that we want to be agile and to go fast. And so we, we had to set up an automated process, a strong process and with, with formation to, to, to make it work well. So first, how we, we cut down our packages and components? We follow atomic design. So I don't know if you, if you know about the atomic design principles. It's, uh, it's um, Brad Ford who, um, who created those principles. And it's, it's, it explains you how to cut your UI components in, in a hierarchy. So the, the biggest one, I'm start, gonna start by the biggest one, it's called, in our, in our case, we used the organism as the biggest one, which is almost a full feature, um, a full page feature. Then inside, you have the molecules. A molecule can be composed in order to make an organism, of course. And then you have the atom, which is a simple UI component. So let, let me come back to that. The impact it has on our code organization. 
So UI, as I just told you, as you've seen before, it's an atom. It's pure UI. There is no business in it. So this is the part I you would expect in a design system, like material UI, for instance. It's completely customizable and composable. Then what comes next? We called it widgets. Um, it's business connected directly this time. It's, it still has a, a pretty, uh, pretty small shape. And it's composable when it shares a common business purpose. So for instance, I was talking about funds. Funds, it's a specific business data. So all the widgets about funds can be composed together to make a bigger product. And at the end, you have the organisms. For instance, the friendship I told you, or, or a chatbot. So that's the advantage. And they are full page features, and they do satisfy by themselves a user need. So a fun sheet is a composition of widgets. Um, but we also, for instance, have a chatbot. And this chatbot needs to answer some, some um, questions about funds. So directly, the chatbot is going to retrieve those widgets and display them as, as it would have done it with a fun sheet. Let's take a deeper look at the code now of each of those parts. So that's, yeah, that's impossible to read. So let's, let's go a little bit in it. At the bottom, so you have the UI. UI is pretty simple. There is not, not a lot to say about that. You have a component. You have its style. Uh, so it's not connected, so you don't have much more. And we do have a theme, a theme, uh, a theme uh, setup and feature. Um, I'm, I didn't, I'm not going to talk about it now, because I'm not going to have the time. But I would love to talk about that later if, you, if you're interested. Um, after that, so if you have our widget, our widget on the on the right of it, you see it's called components. So this is the, the, the UI place. This is where you have your JSX. It's a composition of of UI components mainly that's being fed with data from a container, which is which is classical. The container is going to fetch its data from a service that we created in order to to optimize um, composition of widgets at the at the at the organism level. And it's, it's using what we call a modelizer, which is an adapter of the data that comes from the back in order to, to, to just to clean it and to, and, and to have calculated, uh, cal calculated uh, variables if necessary. So this, this widget, we export it in three ways. As a standalone, so you just take it, you put it inside of your website. Even if you don't have React, it, works, it, it can work. And it, it, displays, it displays directly the data. It fetches it, it loads it, of course, and it displays it without you thinking. And we export it in two two separate pieces as well, as a dumb component without any data, and the, the, the data fetching service by itself for you to be able to recompose it from the top. So for instance, the fun sheet, an organism, is composed on the, on the right side, as you can see, with the purple, of widgets and of um, UI components. On the left part, because our stack, our stack of our website is made of Redux, uh, we decided directly inside of those, of those organisms to, to put Redux. So in order for the, for, the, for the host projects to be able to embed the store of this product in case, uh, for example, inside of their own to do optimization, uh, not have to call twice the same, the same, uh, the same data, or uh, reuse it somewhere else in the, in the application if the data is already available. Um, and this Redux store is using our fetch widget data service to be able to, to, to get the data that is necessary per the widgets you're using. So now, I wanted to, to, to dive a little bit in, into breaking changes because it's an interesting topic and even more for us that uh, any team member, any outside team member can, uh, can, can do a pull request, merge its code in its own, with its own team directly. So there is a risk, of higher risk of breaking changes because if they change something that another team is, wo is working on and without communication, it can, be, it can be problematic. So a breaking change, just for a reminder, is a change in one part of a software system that causes other parts to fail which happens when you change the existing API of, li of libraries without one new user, even, of course, even more. Um, what should I pay attention to? So, for instance, you, we expose components, we expose some functions, but mainly we expose components. So the signature of your components, if you change it, if you change it or if you delete some, some parts, some props, for sure you're going to have issues. So the expose components and function names are their props or the function parameters. That's part of of the potential blocking changes you could make. The component style as well. So it's, it's the style by itself. So I don't know if you change a color or a font. It, it's, it is somehow a soft breaking change because it's still going to have an impact for the end user. It's not going to break your site. But at least if you change a font, it might be weird. But beyond that, the space it takes in terms of height, width, or margin 
is, um, is might, for instance, in this case, might break a website. So this is part as well on the, uh, of, on the little things we need to, to pay attention to when we talk about breaking changes. And last part, when we break the peer dependency, which has a breaking change, for sure the host project will, will have, normally we have to, to update this peer dependency, but we'll have to pay attention to the same breaking changes. So you need to warn them. The example here being, for instance, style components. Uh, we do use style components uh, to, to develop, to, to take care of the style of our components. And you can, it's a peer dependency because you can only have one version running on your code. So if they, if they push a new version with breaking changes, we will have to make sure that our host projects use the same version and fix the same problem with uh, the same type of, of breaking changes. What do we set up to help developers anticipate? We use Flow. It could work with TypeScript um, in our whole code. And we expose, in the same way as Flow typed, um, our API with Flow types connected directly. That's, that's a nice advantage because Flow typed is really is, is disconnected completely to the, to the base project it's supposed to type. It's we, we provide directly the types with our libraries. So they're connected directly. So if a developer changes the signature of a component, changes its props, it's going to break in his ID because he's not going to have changed the exposed flow API. Um, so then it's going to break. He's going to need to change it. He doesn't have a choice. The CI will, will, will be read. He's going he's gonna to adapt his, um, his uh, flow type uh, API. And if he, if he didn't pay attention, his pull request will directly, thanks to danger that runs in the CI, tell him that he changed um, a flow API file and that it might mean breaking change. So he needs to pay attention. And it did help us, in some cases, to, to anticipate breaking changes. Um, there is also an automatic um, semantic versioning uh, system based on the commits, like uh, was mentioned a little bit earlier in another, in another talk. And so when the developer knows he's making a breaking change, he's capable of saying it directly at the commit level, and he's gonna be, it's going to create a major directly. So people know that if, if there is a major to bump, there is potentially a breaking change. And thanks to that, at the same time, there is an automatic change log generation with all the details directly coming from the commits using committeeism. So how do we know that such a project is successful? The little business part that I think is interesting for, for all of us because even as, as tech people, um, we, we need to be able to potentially find a way on the, on the speech to convince uh, business managers to do so, so, such kind of projects. So our return investment formula is, is quite simple. Uh, it's for sure improvable. It's the same for all components who we, we expose. Of the cost, it would have, if it was redone on a normal project, times the number of times this component has been reused. And to this, we subtract our project by itself, full cost, our team, but even the time that the contributors spend to, uh, to contribute. So as a tech team, our main focus is on the right part. It's not on the left part. The left part is the sales part. It's the fact that you, you, find, you find people to reuse your component. It's mainly on the right part. It's to reduce the project cost, meaning that it needs to be faster and easier and more robust to develop on this website with, less, with as, many, as, as, no, as a few bugs as possible. But we didn't arrive to this point after a year without struggling. So what we did, we started tracking the issues, like the issues you would have on a GitHub uh, repository. That's a pretty complex graph yeah, of, um, of our issues. So at the bottom on the bar, you can see that all the issues, it's orange plus red, all the issues that were met, for instance, for, uh, by the other teams that they wanted to share with us. Um, and on the blue, it's a contribution. So it's activity on the repository. It's to see if there is correlation between the number of issues and the activity we have. So there is a correlation, for sure. We can see that at the middle, on the number four, we did, before that, set up enough actions and positive, positive um, tools and, uh, and, yeah, and improvements on our, on our code base to, to, to have a flat number of issues, even though the, the activity was, was a little bit increasing at, us at that time. Why did it increase three times? We discovered lately that it was mainly because there is a lot of turnover, because we're an agency. So the developers, there is a lot of turnover in the developers. And each time that there is an increase in issue, it's mainly because there were new, new developers coming on our project and they didn't know all our flow and how it worked because it's, it's, quite, it's quite dense. 
Um, so with these issues, with this graph, we started tackling them. How did we organize ourselves? So first, every day, like, re like without missing a day, we would take at least an hour to take a look at the ongoing actions of some, uh, some fixes we wanted to set up to make sure that it, it was on track. We then prioritize based on the type of issue. So if it's a bug, it's more important than if a developer just was blocked for five minutes. And the developers lost time. So thanks to this prioritization, we are capable of then tackling the most important ones every day and go into the, into the depths of each issue and to their root causes to understand exactly what in the flow, which can be the, the training of the developer. It can be that potentially it's, meeting, it's, it's missing um, a little tool to, 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 allow, to prevent him from doing a mistake. Uh, to, to do. And then, every week, we took weekly actions to make sure that, uh, in, our, in our development flow normal, we, to make sure that uh, those biggest root causes, as we call them, wouldn't come back. So this is an example of, uh, of our, our diagram of uh, our graph of, of main root causes. And the top one, for instance, lately, is we have a lot of issues with Yarnlink. It's like, I don't know if you know Yarnlink. It's, you connect your, your own, own uh, library to a host project to see directly the impact it has. Um, live on your host project. So it's, it's useful if you want, for instance, uh, so you're, you're developing a website and you're using a library, but something doesn't work well or you want to improve it and see the impact it has on your website, you use Yarnlink. So is it worth it to do such a, such a project? We consider, thanks to the little formula you saw before, that we, did, we, we saved 18% of development costs for those projects since almost a year ago. So for us, this alone, um, is enough to tell us that it, it's worth it and we're going to continue. And a second side effect that, uh, that arised naturally was the fact that it, it created a consistent UI, UI, um, UI, yeah, UI design across all the platforms. That was not always the case because each team was separate, didn't really enough talk to each other and organize themselves so well to have a consistent UI. Now that they shared a common base of, of components, of any size of components, the UX team at the same time had to, to start synchronizing themselves by even more. So for us, it is a success and we're going to continue in the, in the coming year. So that's it. That's it for me. And I wanted to thank the people that worked on this project because it's not, I wouldn't be here if, uh, if we didn't do that all together. Yeah, we have we have one here. Micronus. Micronus. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to know how you guys are managing the versions of the component for the library. So suppose uh, team A, uh, suppose you have a component in the library, tab component, which is an internal component. Mm -hmm. And team A is using version 0 0.5. And uh, there are some bugs and something like that in that component. You fixed it and you expose the new version or whatever. So are you asking all other teams to upgrade their components in their project based or what how you guys are managing that yeah for the, so for the moment it's like it's really an internal uh, company uh, project so all the teams we're not that far from each other so we do have a whatsapp chat and we do we we, we do give uh, news when uh, when something is changing but we're not we're not obliging anyone no one to to upgrade they do as they wish like they would for a normal library so um, so we, we trust them in making the right decision based on, uh, on what we, we change and what we improve. If they see the value in it, because they have to prioritize their own development uh, roadmap. That's why. Okay, so on uh, second question, uh, when you ask your other teams or other products, you, let's say, uh, application team A or two, what you say. Uh, so you guys are exposing it through some Git directory or you are creating an NPM bundle for that? Yeah. Or Okay, so you guys are creating NPM bundle. I didn't want to put this. Yeah, this one is huge. But yeah, we do. Is it? Is it? Is it? Uh, yeah, on the right side you can see the, the little bits. It's Verdacho. So Verdacho, it's a, it's a private NPM. So it means that we uh, we we each each package is, is pushed on this Verdacho. It's really like NPM, 
And then the other teams, when I need to, to take a, the latest update, they do a yarn, yarn add uh, the name of the thing with the right, uh, the right uh, number, the right version. Hi. So when I'm uh, writing my code as components, I always get uh, confused about, for example, if I have a component that takes some text and uh, renders it with the box shadow and with some font color and all those things, I'm always confused about how much customizability should I expose on props for that component. Uh, should the box shadow be also customizable? How much of the styling should be customizable? Yeah. So how do you guys look at this problem of when you build components how much is uh, inherent to the component and how much can be custom customized using props? Okay. Um, what do I have there? No, 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 no. I didn't put it there. Ah. Um, I was expecting a diagram. I don't, I don't have it. Um, how we do that? So there is those three layers. There is UI. There is a, so we call it UI, which are the atoms. Then there is a molecule and then there is organisms. For the, for the atoms, we consider that, so first, First, of course, they are already compliant with the UI, uh, UI design for of the company at first. So most of the time, this is going to be enough for the, for, the, for the other projects. But then, as they're really simple components, we allow um, full, full uh, customizability of the component by itself for the other teams. They can do whatever they want with it. We expose, we expose their, most of their, of their style. We use a specific themes uh, system we did by ourselves with style components. Um, then. At a, at a higher level, when you go through the, to the mo molecules and the organisms, here is different, for, for instance, because we don't want, it's, it would be too customizable and too complex and too crazy after to, to, to anticipate some breaking changes. So here we do uh, allow some stuff, but based on what was really necessary, based on the, on the, on the questions that those teams asked us in terms of improvements they wanted to make on, on, in the style. So it's mainly, it's mainly like color, color of text or the font, um, and sizes, sizes of, of, the, of the components, for instance. And it doesn't go further than that. We, we want to set the style at the same time that, as I told you, it, it does set the, the, UI, the UX for all of those projects, and it's a good thing. Uh, one, one second, please. Uh, please do not leave the auditorium till the QA is done, because we have few announcements to be done. All right? Yeah, next question, please. Hello. Yeah. Hey, Xavier. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. It was a nice one. So, uh, how do you tackle the inter uh, these components communication that you guys are doing? What's the strategy that you guys followed for that? The communication between uh, these components when they communicate, or if if there if there is a communication happening between these components. Yeah. So here, here for instance. So the fun sheet. So that's that's the little thing I didn't explain here because it would have taken more time. The fun sheet is made of, of widgets, of different widgets that are supposed to be connected, indeed. Uh, and the fact how our backend is done is that it's one route, one huge route, that, that gives all the necessary data, data to, to create a fun sheet. So, of course, here you wouldn't want to have, to, if you call 10 widgets, you wouldn't want to, to make 10 calls to the same route. So that's what, what, what that's why we created, and it's pretty, it's pretty raw and straightforward. We created a full service with all the all the the widgets that compose the fun sheet in it, and um, for and this service when you reuse it, you call it and you give it the name of the widget you're composing with, okay, and it's it's gonna for you make the call with the right parameters, um, and the there is several routes there is four routes in total there is some other stuff I, I didn't mention, and it's gonna you're not gonna have to think about that. It's gonna put this, all the data, properly with the modelizers that I told you, so the adapters for each widget, inside of, a, of an output object with the name of the widget and the data it needs to, 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 to get to properly uh, get displayed. And, and then you just have to redo the connection. So you don't, you don't care at all, yourself at least, about how it works inside. But then if you want to create a new widget, it's, it's another problem and it's way more complicated because it's, it's like a big function with a lot of if else. <laughs> yeah, next question. Hey, Anand here. So, uh, of course, a uh, nice presentation, and we asked about the versioning and all, right? So, someone asked from there about versioning. So, 
so it's uh, like you are uh, managing mono depo and uh, how you are actually building these components because you are having atomic molecules and organism right so you might have different build process for these components and how extensibility is working for these components you see, you're saying that may, they might have different build process I'm talking about like what build process approach you have taken uh, for these components and suppose I need to tweak a bit of uh, you know the so for example I take a one atomic component and I want to write something on top of that right which might not be the part of that uh, repo like atomic component but I want something to be changed so how to extension is going to work for those components where I'm trying to use it um, so I don't know if it's, I'm going to answer right to your question, you tell me. Wait, I think you put it there. Did I? Did I not? I did. So we have, we have a, it's, it's a tree, you cannot, I'm sorry, you cannot see it well, but I'm going to tell you. It's a, it's a tree, it's a decision tree that we, we gave to all the POs, the product owners and the developers, uh, for them to be able to make the right decision before making any change inside of the, of the project. And the first, the first step is to make sure that the change they want to make can be a change on something that already exists, or it can be a new feature. It has, they have to prove that it's going to be reused by another team. If they make a change directly to a component that's not going to be reused, we tell them to, to, to customize it directly or extend it directly on their own project first. If they do prove that, then they need to make sure that the, the UX UI is compliant and validate it with the UX UI team, once again. So for this whole uh, UX UI uh, um, working together well. And then last step, it's a technical step and we do a workshop with them, of like, it depends on the complexity of one hour, two hours, to, uh, to understand where we're going to fit this feature on our architecture to, to put it at the right place. All right, so, and what about the server-side rendering, like uh, how you guys are uh, we, we did, managing? We, no. didn't, we didn't for the moment. Okay. It's pure SPA. It's a good question, but we didn't tackle that yet. Yeah, next question. Mentioned a tool that you use in production for monitoring. I was unable to catch the name of that tool. Can you talk more about that? A, a tool for what? The last slide. Yeah, here. No. Where, where was it? It's um, for monitoring your production. Uh, issues? Yeah, issues. You I use a tool. We use a handmade tool with uh, Google Spreadsheets and, uh, and Google Scripts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's working pretty well. So <laughs> all the issues, uh, they're shared on a, on a... We use Trello a lot. Trello boards a lot. Our development process is on Trello board, but our, and it's some specific from my company, our solving process, issue solving process, is also on Trello, on, a, on another board. So when a team has an issue, they create a card with a specific template inside of the Trello board at the beginning of the flow of, of resolution. And we connected directly Google Script to the API of Trello to be able to get the right data and to, to, to show it this way. 